Hello everyone. My name is Arvind Capret and I am an associate professor at Oslo Metropolitan University. And today I shall be talking about causal networks as a possible tool for human level intelligence. So first of all, let us see what is intelligence. Now consider a scenario that you are picking up a pan from an oven or from a stove. And what happens is that while you're picking up a pan, you burn your hand. But then for the next time, when you will be picking up the same pan from the stove, you will be wearing gloves. So now from burning your hand to not burning your hand by wearing gloves, why did this happen? So this happens because depending upon your past experiences, you learn and you take a new decision. And this is what actually intelligence is. So intelligence can be described as the ability to take your memory and then do something based upon the details of that memory. Now in the recent times, there has been a kind of a war, impossible war between the human intelligence and the artificial intelligence. And there's a big question among the researchers. And the big question is that can artificial intelligence supersede human intelligence? So as we described in the previous slide, that human intelligence is basically revolving around adaptation to the environment using a combination of the cognitive process and a very important parameter in the human level intelligence is that it depends upon several cognitive processes. And the researchers in the AI domain, what they are trying to do is they are actually trying to develop such machines which would be replicating or mimicking the human behavior. And depending upon how close they have been in replicating the human behavior, artificial intelligence has been divided into two particular domains. One is the weak AI and another is the strong AI. And it is basically the strong AI which will be answering the question of can artificial intelligence surpass human intelligence? That is, if we have to surpass human intelligence, it is the strong AI which will be able to do that. So what the difference between weak AI and strong AI is, we will explain it a bit later. But then let us see the very key parameters of both the machine intelligence and the human intelligence. Now machine intelligence, this is actually fact based and it is governed by certain laws or rules and data and algorithms play a very vital role in that. However, on the other hand, human intelligence is experience based and as we saw, it is based upon memory, based upon learning and it is influenced by the culture. Machine intelligence, it is adapting to the environments which has abundant amount of data, which means that if you want to make a machine learn, you should have a paid amount of data for that, right? But the good point with machine intelligence is that the data, it could have a lot of dimensions and thus it is having a greater predictability. On the other hand, human intelligence is adapted to environments where the data is low, which means that Although the data is sparse, then there could be a high level of uncertainty. But even in such cases, human intelligence would deliver fair amount of results. However, there are chances that even in the cases where we have low predictability, human intelligence can be used as well. Machine intelligence is definitely more accurate and more effective at deterministic tasks. On the other hand, human intelligence, as we mentioned previously, even when you have high uncertainty cases, which means that the tasks would involve a lot of probabilistic, a lot of uh, probabilistic judgment, even in such cases, human intelligence would deliver much better results than machine intelligence. Then the next uh, thing is, as we, were, we have already talked about it, about strong and weak AI. So let's talk about it a bit more in detail that how this classification is different from each other, right? So weak AI, it is 
I will. It is uh, actually the application of artificial intelligence only for certain specific tasks, right? For example, a chatbot or example of an Apple C, right? So it means that the AI algorithm or the AI solution which you have developed that would only be allowed to do or that would only be able to do one particular task. On the other hand, strong AI, it means that such a system would be able to mimic the human behavior or human mind in a much better way and it can perform varied amount of tasks, not just one specific task, right? Now, this weak AI is also sometimes called as a narrow AI and the narrow AI, so this is just the same thing, but this term is more specifically used in the industrial context. So there is a term called as industrial AI and over there, this narrow AI term is called, but actually the meaning is pretty much same. But then the general AI, it is, as you can see, it is a wider, it has a wider area of application than the narrow AI, which means that it is taking the knowledge from one domain and it can transfer it to another domain. However, super AI, this is something which the researchers are trying to aim at. And if somehow we are able to achieve super AI, then this would be at par with the human intelligence or even greater. Now, why there has been a drastic, I would say, change or advancement from narrow AI to general AI to super AI. And that has been primarily resting upon the shoulders of the evolution of computer power and cost. So as you can see that the first AI winter which we sorry, the first air winter which we had, that was around 1960, 1970 period. And the reason was that the computing power was not that great. However, you can see, if we follow the trend line of 1975, today we should have been somewhere here. But we can see that given the 1995 trend line, which means that there has been a significant change and significant improvement in evolution of computer power. We have somehow reached equivalent to the brain. Uh, we have, we will somehow reach to the brain equivalent by 2030. So this confidence among the AI researchers that they can finally create a machine, which be, which will be able to uh, surpass the human level intelligence that is primarily coming from three main factors. So the first factor is definitely the evolution of computer cost. Another factor is the speed amount of data that uh, we know that data is generated every, I mean, second now, and a lot of amount of data is generated. And then third is definitely the advancement in the computer algorithm itself. So AI claims, I mean, in 1948, when this idea was pretty new, then Sir John von Neumann, he said that you insist that there is something a machine cannot do. If you tell me precisely what it is that a machine cannot do, then I can always make a machine which will do just that. So, I mean, this is a very bold claim. I would say that uh, even in today's era, it's not possible that a machine can do everything which we want it to do. However, let's be fair that AI has done and AI has a certain edge over the human intelligence in certain ways. For example, the speed of execution of the AI solutions is much, much higher. At the same time, these are less biased. Their operational ability is quite uh, uh, higher than the humans. And finally, it comes to the accuracy, which absolutely, uh, which is definitely for, as we mentioned, for the deterministic task. They are more precise in output and they are much more accurate than the humans. And there has been a lot of solutions in AI domain, as, as you can see, in this caricature, there are the logical models, there are the learning models, all of your machine learning comes here, then there are neural networks, that is the deep learning, reasoning with uncertainty is there, then there are a lot of, I mean, even this, uh, the Bayes rule comes in the, uh, uh, this reasoning with uncertainty. So there have been a lot of uh, AI solutions. And if we see that how these AI solutions have kind of performed uh, on the time scale, so here you can see that, in 1970s and 1980s, this uh, 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 fuzzy logic was quite uh, famous, I would say. And at the same time, the Bayesian networks, they started 
to gain momentum and from 1985 they have gained momentum and now they are used a lot along with this uh, the deep learning solutions and support vector machine machine learning these are the solutions which are used a lot these days so it means that there has been a lot of evolution in the various ai solutions and then as we mentioned that uh, ai has outperformed human intelligence in a lot of areas for example this article it say it actually precisely states 11 times the ai beats human at for example games arts law and everything in between and the first major milestone i would say that was the ibm deep blue computer when it uh, for the first time beat a human player and likewise in 2016 ai system actually was uh, performant at a strategy games too which is here this means the game of go so we can see that ai has done pretty well at certain areas but at the same time what i would like to mention here is that ai hasn't i mean somehow lived up to our expectations or what john von newman in 1948 said that uh, where he supposed that a machine can do everything especially from the hollywood movies we see that we have seen ai as a solution which can actually do a lot of things which humans do actually make robots and robots function exactly the way humans function with the cognitive abilities with the decision making but we know that uh, in today's era this is not possible so it was in 1950 where ellen turing somehow saw this gap that there is still there would be still a lacking gap between the ai solution which the which we want to develop and the human level intelligence and in order to test this he actually proposed what he called as an imitation game and which is called as a turing test so what a turing test is it's very simple there is a judge or an interrogator player and then it's kind of a chatbot so the judge is actually chatting with a computer agent and a human responder and based upon this Turing test, there is actually a competition which is called as Loebner Prize. And uh, so actually there are four judges and your computer program or your AI agent, it is actually test upon four basic, uh, three basic categories, that is textual, visual, and auditory. And the judges, they have to define or they have to identify which one is a computer response and which one is a human response. So a lot of teams have won this prize, but till today, None of the chatbots has been able to fool the, all of the four judges. So it means it clearly highlights that there is some gap. And then Ellen Turing also said in 1950 that instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's mind? Because we know that child's mind, how the child learns, the child is learning based upon the memory, based upon the experiences which he has, and then he does not repeat the same incident which has happened with him so likewise a very similar statement was made by judai pearl in 2015 where he said that we probably will not succeed in creating human-like intelligence until we can create a childlike intelligence and a key component is the master of causation so now we delve deep into what is causation but before that let us see that what our machine learning is based upon so machine learning as you know is probably based upon mostly on the statistical concept of correlation and we know that there are a lot of spurious correlations for example the one is highlighted here where there seems to be a perfect relation between the suicides by hanging strangulation and suffocation and the u.s spending on science space and data but if we use our common sense we know that this is not the case neither of them is causing uh, the other one right thus the, we should understand the difference between correlation and causation for example a simple analogy is that if a third person is uh, viewing this uh, uh, thing that an ice cream is melting and someone is kind of having a sunburn and he does not see this part right so he will actually try to see that there is some correlation between ice cream melting and a sunburn but we know that there is the third factor which are called as confounders which is actually causing both of them so whenever we are looking at a relationship whether it is coming from a data or it is coming from an expert 
we must try to identify these confounders and try to see that what is an actual cause because when we are able to identify this cause we would have a better understanding and we would be able to generate an ai solution which would be somewhat like a human intelligence but so i have briefly explained that how these machines can acquire causal knowledge and that could be by identifying confounders that is just one way but now let's go deep into this and before we go into the causal networks which are a means of uh, kind of making a machine learns so let us see and uh, let us step one uh, let us make one step back and understand what bayesian thinking is what are bayesian networks so bayesian thinking is basically that your prior belief or opinion will change in light of a new evidence and the same thing is here so you have a prior pr probability or belief you get some number of new information which generally comes from tests and experiments and this and then after that you revise your probability and you get a posterior probability posterior probability and i would like to mention here that in bayesian thinking we think conditionally and which we all do a small uh, analogy i'll use here so for example consider this is uh, tom and this is nina right so now Tom is about to propose Dina and Tom is a statistician. He is actually a Bayesian statistician. So now the moment Tom kneels down, Nina is having these thoughts in her mind and her prior belief is that, yes, I will marry him. I like him. So now Tom proposes Nina and he says that, will you marry me? But Nina is very clever, right? So he puts up a test and he gives this condition that I will marry you only if you love me unconditionally. But Nina doesn't know that of a Tom is a Bayesian statistician and he says and this is the evidence that sorry I can't love you unconditionally because I have Bayesian thinking because this man is a practical man and he knows that there are conditions right for everything and then what happens the posterior oh my god you can see this right so this is just some analogy which explains that how in the light of evidence your prior probability changes to your posterior probability and Bayesian networks these are actually the means of uh, kind of capturing this whole process right the Bayesian networks a simple Bayesian network is shown over here which is actually an animal guessing game so an important point to note here is that this is called as a parent node this is a child node right so and this arrow this is actually uh, showing a dependency a probabilistic dependency between a parent node and a child node and these arrows they are um, how this relationship this probabilistic relationships are developed this is happening with the help of a condition probability table which is shown here so these probabilities they can either come from data i mean you can use surrogate models to fill them or they can come directly from experts so that is an advantage of Bayesian networks that you can uh, utilize these uh, with the help of either expert knowledge or from data but all of these as we said that Bayesian networks these are evidence-based right you put in evidence and you see how the other factors change but now we have to move from evidence to causes and that is where the ladder of causation comes into play so briefly the ladder of causation has three rungs the first is the seeing doing and the second is the doing rank and finally it is an imagining or the rank of counterfactuals so let us describe each of them one by one so the first rung is the rung of association or prediction and which means that we have to find a phenomenon which have which are related and it is generally the rules of probability theory and the statistical data right we use a lot of statistical data to identify that how the various components are related and most of your machine learning algorithms they are actually relying or, or actually fall into this category so let's take an example for example the store manager wants to have uh, wants to know one thing and he has a question that how likely is it that a customer who bought a toothpaste would also buy a dental floss. Now, in terms of probability, this can directly come from a simple equation. That is, we are given the data, we want to identify the probability of floss given we know the probability of toothpaste, right? So generally we would use correlation and regression analysis and other sort of analysis, and we would determine the association between them. And as I mentioned, machine learning and deep learning fall into this rung. Of association but as I also mentioned that 
statistics or correlation cannot answer what is the cause and what is the effect which means that we don't know whether it is the sale of the toothpaste which is affecting the flaws or is it vice versa hence we need to go to another rung or the higher rung that is the rung of intervention or the rung of doing so how it is different from association is i will tell you it now right here we are interested in this question for example let's take an example that here we are interested to find what will happen to our floss sales if we double the prices of toothpaste so what we are trying to do is we don't have a data of we don't have an actual data which would actually tell us that how your floss will change when the prices of toothpaste were doubled right so we are doing an intervention here we are actually trying to able to guess what the effect will be if you perform one action and as you can see this is clearly at a higher level than association because here you are trying to predict future based upon an intervention and here how you can do it you will actually determine it with the help of a causal model and you are interested in determining the probability p of flaws given do toothpaste so this do uh, probability concept it has been kind of proposed by judai pearl and his students and with the help of three uh, i would say axioms they can actually relate the do probability with the normal probability theory that is a very good uh, thing i would say thus we change the environment continuously in the second rank and then those causal relationships are identified or i would say that those relationships are identified as causal which are actually invariant across all the environments which have been created by experiments so this is how it is done right so in our case floss and toothpaste so what we would do is we would actually firstly say double the price of toothpaste and then maybe half the price of toothpaste something like and identify that how your uh, floss sales are uh, changing and we would also do that we would change the prices of floss and identify how it is affecting toothpaste and in these cases wherever which of the factor is kind of invariant right that would be a causal relationship so we can clearly identify that if the relationship between floss and toothpaste is invariant by changing the price of toothpaste then floss is the cause and toothpaste is the effect otherwise it's vice versa however at this rung also there is uh, there are uh, certain disadvantages and that is that we cannot actually answer all the questions of interest which we would like to answer right so that is why we actually move to the next level which is the level of counterfactuals or the level of imagination so here rather than doing intervention we are actually imagining and we are imagining uh, a kind of a hypothetical situation which doesn't exist in the past which is not shown by data right and that is why the counterfactuals have a problematic relationship with data because data by definition they are facts right however the counterfactuals they are just an imagination of the analyst or the one who is performing experiment for example for our case let us say that hmm, what is the probability that a customer who brought toothpaste would still have bought it if we would have doubled the price now this is different from the intervention because here we are comparing the real world where we know that the customer has brought the toothpaste at the current price right to the fictitious world where the price is twice as high thus in this way the analyst he creates a lot of questions and he creates a lot of um, imaginative uh, ideas and he tried to see and then how do we solve them we solve them with the help of the function ca causal model which would give you an answer so let's take a simple example and the simple example is of a simple ecosystem so consider that there are four binary stochastic variables called as soil plant insect and birds right and we get this data now the first thing is so okay so data is good right no problem the more we have the good it is but from this data we don't actually tend to see the causal relationship so what is zero and one i'll explain it since these are binary so if soil is zero it means that soil is not nutrient rich however if it is one then it means that it is nutrient rich 
Likewise, for plants, insects, and birds, one means that they are present and zero means their absence. But from this data, we don't know what causes what. However, when we use expert knowledge and we develop a causal diagram, then we clearly know that what is the cause and what is an effect, which means that the presence of bird depends upon all of these factors directly or indirectly. It directly depends upon your presence of insects and the presence of plants, and it indirectly depends upon your soil that it is mutant rich, right? So now if we want to predict this probability, that is, which is a joint probability distribution function, we would get from this causal relationship, we would get something like this. And here you can read what it means. So now let us explain the same thing, how we would get different answers based upon the letter of causation. So first is the level of association. So for example, you have, you go to a plot where you find a particular plant species is present. Then you try to find that, okay, what is it likely that there would be the presence of the birds. So it is a simple probabilistic equation and you try to identify it this and this is the Bayes theorem and this is can this can be easily solved with the help of Bayesian networks as well, right? And the second is the level of intervention, which means that if we see that there are some plants or if we seed some plants, right? Which means that forcing P is equal to one. So now, we are saying that definitely this particular plant is present there, right? So we are forcing, so this is an intervention. And then we try to see that, okay, if we know that there will be a plant for sure, for 100% we are sure, then how will it impact the probability of uh, the birds, that the birds are present? So this here is what we do, the do operator, right? And as I mentioned, these are not generally equally. And there are three equations how or three axioms how you can go from here to here right so this you can learn more about it from the judea pearl book called as causality they have kind of derived these right the third and the most interesting is the imagination or the counterfactuals and here we say that there we see a specific plot which has or we actually propose a plot which has neither a plants nor birds right we are imagining this that, okay, suppose there is some plot where there is neither a plant nor a bird. So consider this thing that in reality, there is no such plot. There would not be um, a plot like this where there are neither birds nor plants. But here, what we're trying to do is we're imagining that, okay, suppose a worst case situation happens, right? And we get a plot that there are neither plants nor birds. Then we try to see that, okay, would there be birds right? If certain plants are present there, right? So this is a clearly imagination. And this is how you would put it in terms of probability. And then you would use your functional causal models. I will not go into the detail of what these are. If you're interested, you can read the two books. One is the book of why and another is the causality both by Judah Apple. And you would try to figure out this answer, right? So conclusively, I would like to say that AI in the present stage, particularly machine learning is doing good. And particularly when we have a lot of trained data and when we are training, we think that it is quite easy, but the real world is very complex, right? And we can face a lot of challenges. And another thing is that machine learning models, they are based upon correlation from the data directly. We can't see what is causing what, right? What is the cause and what is the effect? But however, with the help of causal networks or the Bayesian networks, we can somehow using expert knowledge, make a graph which would actually help us to identify the causality. And then finally, we could use this uh, letter of causation depending upon at which level we are. And then definitely if we have to surpass the human intelligence, the AI today has to surpass human intelligence, this, the counterfactuals, that is imagination that what if I change something? What if I had acted differently in the past, right? How would it change my scenario in the future? So this is something which we have to focus upon if we have to create a possible machine which would surpass human level intelligence. So that's it guys, thank you for your attention. And these are the references if you would like to see, that's all, thank you.